Remote Sensing 1. This is Patrick McAfee. I'm your instructor for this course. I have um, quite a bit of experience in remote sensing. I've been working in remote sensing uh, using satellite imagery and um, high, medium, and low elevation aerial photography uh, since the mid-1970s. So it goes back quite a ways. I guess you can you can do the math and figure it out. Um, I'm uh, this is one of my favorite classes, if not my favorite class. It it's it's up there. Uh, I I really enjoy teaching this class. I mostly enjoy remote sensing uh, because I've been able to uh, you know spend much of my career studying, analyzing, and um, really making discoveries from uh both digital and uh analog aerial imagery i just i really like to look at images and to interpret them and and um try to figure out what's going on in the image just something that really sort of hooked me on um on mapping and on remote sensing as a, a specialized part of mapping uh, very early in my career um so this uh, first presentation in this course is an introduction to uh, some of the principles that um, are the foundation, a little bit of history, um, to so that you understand uh, where this technology came from and um, where, uh, you know, wh what we're doing with it now somewhat. Uh, although, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are happening in remote sensing uh, presently. And um, so, you know, this is mainly an introduction to the um, to what we're going to be doing in the in the course. The um, this is a land remote sensing course. Uh, we're normally looking uh, through the atmosphere. We're almost always looking through an atmosphere, and so uh, um, we're not really trying to do meteorological remote sensing necessarily. We do often see you know, a lot of um, weather and um, atmospheric um, phenomena, things that happen in the atmosphere. And so, you know, these are things that we have to uh, deal with as we're, as we're doing our remote sensing because we're mainly interested in looking at the um, surface of the Earth and the land surfaces of the Earth. Although we do look at, uh, you know, look at bodies of water, and we analyze bodies of water also with our, um, with our remote sensing instruments and the data that we collect with them. Uh, this, um, this image we're looking at is, it should be rel relatively familiar to you. It's the, uh, the central part of the Lincoln Park campus, and just looking at this, you can, you can see it's a, you know, there's a number of colors here. This actually is a classed image. So there's a relatively uh, small number of colors in this image, you know, seven or eight colors. Some of the, um, because this is a digital image, some of the images that we'll work with through the term have just an absolutely astounding number of uh, possible colors in, uh, in each, each pixel. Um, you know, we work principally with 24-bit color, so 24-bit color that comes from VGA monitor, you can have up to 16.7 million colors. And uh, now we're working with um, higher spectral resolution imagery that goes far beyond that in terms of the possible uh, number of values, certainly, that we can, uh, we can record and analyze um, we'll talk about some big numbers and big data later on as we go forward. You know, remote sensing has a, a relatively long history as a technology. It goes back to uh, the mid-1800s. Uh, there was a, a man in Paris, I think, um, who had the, uh, you know, some of the, the earliest, uh, certainly, uh, images, photographic images uh, that were taken from platforms, aerial platforms. Um, this 
oddly enough, this uh, Stefan's patent from 1887, uh, the balloon with the camera dangling beneath it. Uh, Stefan's was a Chicagoan, uh, and he got this patent in uh, in 1887. This came out of the patent office. This is something I found while I was working in in the uh, Library of Congress, and this. Um, you know this device he used this he was uh, had some renown back in the 1880s and 1890s and he used this for photographing different big events parades and um, celebrations and things that were happening you know sporting events and so on uh, in in Chicago in and around Chicago back in the late 1800s and you know this is a technology that really took advantage of um, the people who were using it took advantage of the different aerial platforms that were available. So it started on balloons and then eventually went to kites, uh, kites and then, um, you know, dirigibles, blimps, and, and also airplanes. And airplanes became the predominant platform or the, the preferred platform for aerial imaging because of their, its low cost and high speed and ability to move around. You can kind of think of an airplane as a uh, motorized uh, kite that's not on a string. The You know, the Wright brothers were working with big box kites, really, when they started out with their experiments in aviation. But, um, you know, the the um, there is a long history of this. It's a very interesting history, and there's a number of references I can recommend if anyone's interested in doing some background reading on this. Um, really, in uh, World War One is where um, there was this big shift to um, more, I guess you would call it, um, quantitative or scientific even um, analysis of aerial images, principally uh, sorting out all the geometry around uh, aerial images where you're capturing a... Um, an image of something that's three-dimensional, the surface of the earth, um, you know, so that you have an X, Y uh, dimension, X and Y dimension, latitude and longitude, and then you have, or some other coordinate system, and then you have a Z uh, dimension, the elevation of the earth, and then also the, this is uh, because the, the camera is operating on, a, on an aerial platform that's actually moving as well, uh, you have other, you know, other geometries that are associated with this platform. And so there's a science that came out of this period in the early 20th century with um, World War I being kind of a uh, place where a lot of innovation actually took place in terms of aerial imaging and, and uh, photography. And so the science of photogrammetry uh, came about really through a number of uh, technological advances that took place, and so photogrammetry, um, you know, as a as a technology and as a as a science, um, was a way of capturing information about objects um, that was you know really capturing the reflected uh, electromagnetic energy from objects that were uh, you were not in contact with the the camera and so you have a three-dimensional object you can see in this diagram you know the surface of the earth being uh recorded onto a two-dimensional plane the the plane of the uh film in or the film plane in the aerial camera and so this geometry which is similar to the geometry that we uh have to um sort out and and work with in uh, satellite imaging but some somewhat different um, it this geometry you know was the main problem that had to be solved in photogrammetry and so um, you know there's a actually there's a, an entire chapter in our textbook about photogrammetry and um, sort of the how this was all sorted out and this has a lot to do with what we're doing uh, with imagery now in GIS because of the, the importance of georeferencing and being able to um, locate and identify uh, things that, that we uh, see and uh, that we record 
um, on the surface using our using our uh, imaging sensors now, our digital cameras, uh, we we need to be able to locate those very precisely in um, in geographic space using some geographic coordinate system like latitude and longitude, for instance. Uh, so if you look at this, you may be able to think about and reading reading your text, you'll understand what some of the um, distortions and um, and um, di just differences in the image that have to be accounted for when you're turning it into a uh, transforming it from a two dimensional three dimensional to a two dimensional uh, image. Uh, you know, and so again, this geometry is, this is important, uh, not, not that, you know, we really have to work through the trigonometry of all of these solutions because a lot of this stuff is solved for us now in the data that we get and in the systems that we work with. You're going to find that, you know, working with aerial imagery is relatively easy in terms of bringing it into uh, GIS and making everything fit together very well. Things are working fairly well with the data that we're working with now. We really, we really have come a long way uh, since, since I was, you know, first doing this in the 1970s, things have, have gotten so much better and uh, we're, you know, we're in a, a very good place in terms of um, all the problems that we faced with, um, you know, with the aerial imagery that we've worked with over the last, you know, century and a half. So, you know, one of the things that um, we do with aerial imagery is we do three-dimensional topographic models. And so topographic mapping and all the topographic mapping, certainly of the United States and much of the world as well, was done using um, what what we term uh, stere stereoscopy or uh, stereo photogrammetry, where you have two images that are overlapping and they are of the same part of the earth, but they're taken from different perspectives. So they're as, as, a, as an, uh, uh, either a satellite or an aircraft is flying along and taking pictures of the surface of the earth, it takes overlapping pictures so that you are actually, um, you, you wind up having what are called stereo models where you have, um, you have a perspective that allows you to model a three-dimensional surface and actually to see a three-dimensional surface um, when you're doing this kind of work. And so this uh, person here, this is a person that was working at the Tennessee Valley Authority in the 1930s, um, is he's in a dark room uh, and the, the room's completely dark and then there are projectors. You can see four of them in the frame up there and each of these projectors has a, a an image in it, a film image that's being projected down into the space that he's looking at above his table. And he actually has a pair of glasses on. You can see he's wearing glasses and they actually look like sunglasses and in, in fact they are, except one lens is red and the other lens is blue. And so the, the uh, images that are being projected are being projected through filters, one being red and the other being blue, so that he sees an image in three dimensions floating above the table of the surface of the earth. And he's moving a device through that image and recording, actually drawing contour lines by holding a little dot in the center of that little oval shaped uh, or round platform there that's on the on the uh, the device he's holding in his two hands he's holding a little dot right on the surface of the earth and moving this thing along and that's actually tracing a contour line just like the contour lines that many of you have probably seen on topographic maps the topographic maps that we use when we go hiking or backpacking or what have you. I think people still use those. I'm not sure. I, I kind of grew up with those and used them really into, you know, into my 30s 
before you know things just started changing but actually into my 40s i guess you could say till things really started changing and you know we started having three-dimensional models on our phones and that sort of thing so anyway this is how we mapped the terrain of the entire uh, of, of all of north america and much of the rest of the world um, using devices like this so using film uh, and cameras and uh, dark rooms and and all of that which really was around uh, almost well in, into the 1990s and just about everywhere you know there were dark rooms for working purposes they were workplaces um, now people that have dark rooms are hobbyists you know and they do it kind of as a hobby because people don't really work with these anymore much if they do it's just a really odd kind of uh, niche um, of the, uh, you know, the photographic and the imaging industry. Uh, so, you know, again, here's a topographic map, and you can see the, um, you know, the contour lines here. These are contour lines that were drawn by a person, just like that person you saw in the image before, who, um, you know, was tracing these contours that are, um, they're iso lines, they're isometric lines that are, um, tracing the surface of the earth so it's kind of like a um maybe we'll take a we'll take a walk over and we'll we'll take a look at our uh, our augmented reality sandbox that's about the best place i know to uh to uh, learn a bit about uh, topographic mapping and also stereo stereo mapping and stereoscopy uh using an xbox uh connect actually and this is in the lab actually it's on the it's in our break room uh, so we have a sandbox that you can play in in our break room in the lab that you can work in if you like. It's in uh, room 3135 in uh, the um, building, building, in the 990 Fullerton building. But again, this is a topographic map, and these are the kind of maps that were compiled by that person um, and, other, and, you know, thousands of other people like that person um, for over a period of about 100 years. Uh, into the into the uh, 1990s, actually, it was about when this this process ended. So, as we were doing all this fo uh, photogrammetry, there was a lot of photography that was taken, and it's not imagery yet. We're still calling it photography because it was done with cameras, film, chemicals, uh, and developed and processed. And these were analogs; they weren't digital, although. Much of many of these images now are being scanned. They're in the process of being scanned, but there really are probably hundreds of millions of these just just in the United States aerial photographs like this that are a historical record of what was in place at a particular time. So, for instance, this is the north side of Chicago. You probably recognize it, um, Belmont Harbor. Um, this diversity harbor here and so you know Fullerton is I believe right here there's the intersection of um, Lincoln and Halstead let's see here's Lincoln here's Halstead and there's Fullerton so that's the six-point intersection there Lincoln Link, Lincoln Halstead and Fullerton and so when you look at this you go okay well here's why these things are important you see this right here that is uh, the third side of the Old Town Triangle. There's the Old Town Triangle. Now, if you look at today's maps, that is gone. That is Ogden Avenue that was completely closed uh, on the north, uh, north side of Chicago. It's, it's been built. You can see little tiny traces of it if you look carefully at the map. But it was a big boulevard that carried people from the southwest side of the city right up to Lincoln Park and the Lincoln Park Zoo and all that wonderful stuff up there, right up at, uh, you know, where, where um, you know, Lincoln Park is, has all of the, you know, kind of the big, the big items in Lincoln Park, or they were the big items back then. But, you know, th you know, this again, this is an example of why this kind of photography and the millions and millions of images that we have are so important because they're a historical record of where we were in at particular times and they can be used they can be very useful and i'll talk more about them you know as we as we go along you know just because this is something i don't want people to forget 
as we go forward. So if, if you ever want to figure out where we are in this course, um, you can always look back to this image. This is figure 1.1 from our text. And we work through the different parts of this as we're, you know, as we're going through the, the um, remote sensing process. So it starts with the sun normally for most of our remote sensing. For most of our remote sensing, the sun is our source of energy. And so the electromagnetic energy from the sun is propagated through the atmosphere. Uh, things happen to it while it's in the atmosphere. It's Some of it's absorbed, some of it's scattered, and some of it is transmitted through, thankfully, and it uh, strikes the surface of the earth. It likely hits water, but if it, if it hits land, uh, you know, it's reflected mainly or um, absorbed. Uh, if it hits water, it's reflected or absorbed, and it can also be transmitted into the, uh, you know, through the water because water is transparent. If it's clear, it's not muddy. And, you know, it can actually be reflected off of uh, the bottom of whatever body of water it's in or the, the uh, if it's relatively shallow under about 100 feet or so, it can be reflected off the bottom and back out through the water, back out through the atmosphere and transmitted back up through the atmosphere. Other things happen you know, here at the surface. And this really is the very interesting part of what we're doing right here. This is what, this is our thing here. One of the things, the main things that we're interested in is what happens right when sunlight hits the surface and is reflected off the surface and back, and transmitted, retransmitted back through the atmosphere. Same things happen to it as when it came through, although it's been modified now because it hit the surface of the earth and it's been selectively reflected. And then it's transmitted back through the atmosphere and maybe sensed by aircraft with sensors on them that are op operating in the atmosphere, or perhaps it makes it out of the atmosphere and is sensed by a remote sensing satellite, a digital remote sensing satellite. And virtually all the instruments that we use in aircraft now are digital instruments as well. Uh, and so after that data is collected, it's, you know, either turned into, if it were a photograph, which it, I can't really imagine anyone that would have a, you know, a, a an analog photograph anymore, but historically there would be a photograph. Now it's almost all digital and most of it is not even on, uh, you know, on a, a CD ROM or a DVD ROM as we see right here. And then it's processed as a, a digital image and we analyze it, turn it into smarter things information products so we become a participant in the information economy and then we pass it on to users here at the end um, so this is you know this is a remote sensing process and and uh, you know if you ever wonder where you are you can find yourself somewhere in this chain between a and i h i yes uh, so we work with the spectrum and we work with the wave uh, theory of electromagnetic radiation. And so we do uh, discriminate between different types of electromagnetic radiation based on the wavelengths of that radiation. And we mostly are interested in energy in the visible spectrum and in the near and mid, and also in the thermal infrared. Now you can you can see here I've got I've I've mentioned three different types of energy, three different types of infrared energy. We know infrared is that energy that's just outside of the red, right? So the red, this is the visible part of the spectrum. Here's R O Y G B, and we can stick indigo in here between blue and violet, and we'd have Roy G. Biv. Many of you may remember that from a high school science class. But outside of the visible, we have different types of infrared imagery. So we are very interested 
in the infrared. The infrared is a real useful part of the spectrum for us, but it's outside of the visible. So we have near and mid infrared that we use a lot in remote sensing. This is reflected infrared. It's not heat. It's not temperatures. Temperatures are sensed in a different part of the infrared, a longer wavelength part of the infrared. And we typically look right around this part, 10 micrometers uh, in the, in the, um, in that part of the, of the thermal infrared for temperature. And we do look at temperature. And so you're going to see some things that have never been seen before. Um, I'm, I'm convinced of that and this, you know, uh, that's my, that's my story and I'm sticking with it, but I am convinced that you're going to see things this term that have never been seen before, likely never been seen before by human eyes because so much of the data that we're working with doesn't really get analyzed. There aren't that many people doing this work. And so sometimes when you start downloading images from a uh, government archive, Maybe nobody's ever worked on these images seriously or looked at all of the different channels, including the uh, near, mid, and thermal infrared channels that are not visible to, um, you know, to you and I. So, again, this is just something to think about. But we, do, we are going to work with the spectrum a lot, and we'll be talking about it a lot. And if there's one thing that's kind of a wonky, um, nerdy, uh, science-y, kind of thing that you're going to take out of this class, it's going to be a much better understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum and how, how energy works, how it's transmitted uh, through the atmosphere and how, it's, um, how it's, it's sensed and recorded by us using cameras and scanners. Uh, so the program that we work with mostly in here is the Landsat program. Landsat is the most important program, uh, civilian remote sensing program in history. It's, it may be the most important uh, data acquisition program in terms of uh, global change and climate change in history as well because of its timeline because it's, we've been collecting data continuously, uh, pretty much. There's been a couple little glitches in the, in the program, but we've been collecting data pretty much continuously since 1972 to the present. And right now, you know, things look good for the future. We're, um, we're, we currently are working with Landsat 8. Landsat 8 is, uh, working very well. It's doing, doing fine the last time I checked. Um, we, we can get data from Landsat 8, you know, within an hour or so after it's been sensed. We can be downloading that data and doing analysis on it. So um, this is, that's pretty exciting time. It's a big, you know, this is a big improvement from where we've been for the last 40 years working with Landsat. Last 40, you know, almost we're, we're approaching 50 years now, sorry to say. But, um, you know, it's, it, it, it is, uh, it is a, a very important program, and virtually everyone in civilian remote sensing and in, in uh, um, other types of remote sensing as well cut their eye teeth on uh, Landsat and learned this is where we start learning about digital remote sensing is with Landsat. Because of the data, because the data that's available is such an important data set, and because there are so many programs that have followed Landsat that have very similar um, uh, designs to them, and they and they look in similar parts of the spectrum. Although there's been you know a lot of innovation and change lately, but you'll see as we go forward that um, you know that Landsat very important. And again, Landsat eight we're working with now. Uh, it's an eleven channel. Uh, sat, um, sensor. So in other words, it looks in 11 different separate parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can think of that as, you know, how our, our, with our eyes, we sense three different colors and we mix them together to produce the, you know, the amazing color that we see with our eyes. Well, these cameras look at 11 different 
colors and since 11 different colors and now we're recording it as 16-bit data so this means that we're really talking about trillions of different possible colors that we're sensing uh, sensing the entire earth every 16 days every 30 meter square on earth gets a new number every 16 days this is a it's a staggering amount of data that's being collected and uh, we really need you know we need a lot of great people to um you know to work with this and to to do the kinds of work that we need to do because the world is changing really really fast and that's that's why that's why we need remote sensing that's the main reason we need remote sensing is because of change because things are changing uh and they're changing um very very quickly uh but uh, Landsat 8 again we're working with and again this gives you a sense of how when we look at the spectrum here you can see you can look at this more carefully later this is a really useful diagram but you can see these are the different parts of the spectrum that we look at and this is the visible right here and then these are the parts out in the infrared that we look at and you can see we're looking at places where it's you can actually see something where um, where light is transmitted through the atmosphere because, um, you know, this, this is what's available to us. These are the parts of the, parts of the spectrum. Looking at the, the spectrum here now in nanometers, these are the parts of the spectrum that we have available to us through the near and um, the visible the near and mid and thermal um, thermal uh, uh, spectrum, thermal infrared spectrum out here. You know, long, longer wavelength is a different part of the spectrum, but we are looking there and we're looking and recording data there, and it's fascinating. We're going to be working with thermal data in our second activity in here. Our first activity, you know, it's mostly, uh, you know, kick the tires, get used to working in this environment, make a beautiful image, um, try to explain what you did. And, uh, and you know, it's a, so it's a, you know, this first, first image is a, a good, it's a great introduction to working with these data, acquiring, accessing these data. And you can get data for anywhere in the world and work anywhere in the world in this class you can do that with your you know with your project that you're going to do at the end so um, you know again uh, and because we work in a GIS context now we start to think of things as layers tightly geo-referenced and here you can see a um, you can see that we're this is a Landsat thematic mapper so this is up through Landsat 7 the sensor that we were working with, where we were working with 8-bit data, and um, blue, green, red, three reflected infrared, and then a thermal infrared channel right here. So near and mid infrared, and then three visible channels here. So again, things that human eyes can't see, we can see with our sensors. And because of GIS, we're able to combine this data and combine our analyses now with all the incredible GIS data that's available. So this just gives us this um, kind of incredible, um, you know, data set to uh, be a really powerful geospatial analyst and to do really powerful geospatial analyses. So, um, you know, this is this is where we are. I always like to like to go back and just touch on the spectrum again, because you know this is this is important. And you know, we just the more you look at this and you think about it, this is what we're going to what we're going to be working with. And again, this is another view. This is from your text. This is another view of the spectrum and the different parts of the spectrum that are available to us to look at. So this is why the channels looked at the, the way that they do. They look, um, you know, they're lo we're looking in parts of the spectrum where you have, uh, you have energy available that actually passes through the atmosphere and gives us, um, you know, the ability to 
record and analyze reflected um, energy from different types of um, land cover or land use that's going on on the surface of the earth. What's going on? You know, I mean, that's always the, that's always kind of the mystery for, um, you know, for what we're doing. Um, so, and we also, this is the thing that, that makes it really fascinating is that as you look at, um, at data collected across the visible and the near and mid infrared, you'll start to see that things on the surface are selectively reflective. So in other words, something that appears red, if someone's wearing a red shirt, the, it's reflecting in the red part of the spectrum. If someone's uh, wearing a, a green shirt, it's reflective in the green part of the spectrum, or more reflective in the green part of the spectrum. Uh, but you can see that as soon as you get outside of the visible, and the visible ends right about here, it's, excuse me, the visible ends right about here, there's a lot of variation in the reflectivity of different types of land cover. So we're really looking at some real generic types here. Uh, dirt, uh, grass, clear water, and muddy water. So, but there are, there's so much more to look at. There's so much more to see as you'll, as you'll see when you start, when you start looking and start seeing, you know, some of the things that we see around cities and around forests and around um, agriculture. And there's just, there's so much to see on the surface of the earth. And so this is what, this is kind of the puzzle that we're trying to solve, that we're trying to piece together with our imagery. And we have some really powerful analytical tools to uh, help us, to help us do this. Uh, so again, this is where we start at the sun and we end up with bunch of people sitting around a table, decision makers, right? Or people that are um, really working to understand what's happening, what's happening in this, um, you know, in this, this linear process, starting with energy from the sun and ending with information products that we've produced as remote sensors. So, um, you know, Take, start taking a look at your, at your material. Look at, um, there, remember there is an activity that's, a, that we're starting on here at the beginning of the course. And, um, you know, you'll find that in the activities. So, um, looking forward to a great term with everyone.